Okay, so I'm going to be talking today about language-related regions, their site architecture, their receptor architecture, and a bit about organizational principles. And um, it's starting beautifully because it's not working. Yes. Okay, so um, there are basically two regions involved in language. Uh, the frontal speech region was described as early as 1861 by Broca, and he, it consists of uh, areas 44 and 45. And the posterior one is Wernicke, and that was described uh, 10 years later for the, uh, in 1871. Now, nowadays we know that, that the network involved in language comprehension and production isn't quite as restricted as um, these areas here. And we tend to talk about uh, extended Broca region, which not only encompasses areas 44 and 45, but also 47, 46, uh, area 6, extending measly onto um, SMA, so uh, language the production, preparation for language production, and extended Wernicke's region, which is then not only areas 22, <coughs> mainly the posterior part of area 22, and 21, and of course area 41, the primary auditory cortex, and 42, but uh, inferior parietal areas 40 and 39 and 37 on uh, temporal lobe uh, areas 20 and um, 38. And before I talk more about brain regions, I'd like to show you a video uh, that was taken during epilepsy surgery. And the patient was asked to um, count one, two, three, four, five. And the surgeon stimulated different parts of the brain surface because they wanted to locate brain area. Did you hear the stimulation? Okay, so would you say that this patient had problems remembering the numbers she was supposed to be saying, or she had problems pronouncing them? Pronouncing them. And um, was it the same everywhere? So when the surgeon stimulated this bit here, she didn't have any problem at all. When they stimulated this bit here, she could sort of like pronounce, but it sounded slurred. When they stimulated here, she couldn't say anything at all. And when this bit here was stimulated, she said, la lingua, my tongue. Um, 
So if she had problems articulating and not remembering the things she was supposed to say, what part of the region would you say was being stimulated here? What part of the language system, the um, motor component of the language system, so Broca's area, or the language comprehension um, section, the Annika's area? The motor area, exactly. So that is um, the part of the of the brain that was stimulating. They were stimulating Broca's area here, and that's the part of the of the language um, region that I'll be okay talking about next. To really know where the borders are, no, no, I, I mean, but I'd have to, I'd have to cut out her brain. I know to, to really identify no, cytotectonical. I took it. That here is the uh, inferior frontal sulcus. Here, and. It, Going up that way would be um, uh, the precentral sulcus. Sorry, one more question. Um, I wonder if the stimulation was anything like transcranial current stimulation, which actually just increases the excitability of the cortex, which would not have or would not result in the impairment of the function. I'm not sure, I'm sorry. So it's anatomically a high resolution, this one here versus the, um, okay. Right, Broca's region. Um, it was first described, <coughs> as I said earlier, uh, 1861 by Pierre Paul Broca. And um, he had uh, a patient called um, Mr. Monsieur Le Bon. Monsieur Le Bon had suffered um, brain damage at the age of 20 or so which left him unable to speak. He was only able to say the syllable ta, and that's why um, this patient is colloquially, or <coughs> was nicknamed um, ta. And when the patient died, um, Broca carried out the autopsy, had a look at his brain, and the next day presented um, his, his uh, results, which were that the patient had an enormous lesion which had dis destroyed the third frontal convolution. And that's why Broca said this is the part of the brain that enables speech production. And this is one of the first um, cases or, or uh, instances in which function has really been localized. Um, now, we know from anatomy of normal brains that the area destroyed by the legion in, in um, Tan's brain uh, is uh, localized in this pass triangularis, so between the horizontal branch and the ascending branch of the lateral fissure here in yellow, and, um, and also the opercular part here um, behind the, the uh, diagonal sulcus. So if we get rid of the sulci, which don't interest us, and um, right, so pars triangularis and uh, pars opercularis, so we've got areas 44, 45, and then we'd have 46 down here. And many other um, anatomists then examined the cytoarchitecture and the myeloarchitecture of these brain regions, and they published uh, what we call the, the classical uh, maps, um, 
of, in this case, of Broca's region. So in all maps, what we've done is we've labeled area, Brodman's area 45 in yellow and uh, 44 in red. Now in this case, it's not that it's flipped, it's because uh, this is a left hemisphere and this is a right hemisphere. And what you can see is that um, in the different maps, the extents of area 44 and 45 are different. So sometimes they are larger, for example, the map by Vogt. Um, sometimes they're relatively small, as in the one by von Economo and Koskinas. Sometimes it's really just two areas. That's in the case of uh, Brodman. Um, the Sarkisov map also has only two areas, the same as Brodman had. But in other maps, what we have actually occupying the space in which Brodman described 44 and 45, we have several areas. And it's not just that we've coded these in yellow and red because we thought that that was good. It's because actually these scientists described these areas and said, well, my areas 56 and 57 correspond to Brodman's area 44 and my 58 and 59 to his 45. So we have a variability here in the number of areas located in this uh, Broca region. And it's not just that we have a variability when we look at the maps produced by different uh, groups. We also have a variability if you look at the maps within one publication. So um, this is a Meyerlock architectonic study by Strasburger. And uh, it shows diagrams from three individual brains. And um, you see that, for example, in this case here, Area 58 only has one part and 59 has a part A and a part B. In this other hemisphere, areas 58 and 59 aren't subdivided. And um, in this hemisphere over here, it's area 58 which is subdivided into an A and a B and area 59 which hasn't been subdivided. So this kind of studies um, in those days, these, these scientists, they got into fights and some of them said, you are being just too picky and itty and bitty and you're over parcelating. And um, the ones with less regions were telling the ones with more regions, you're over parcelating. And the ones with, with more regions were saying, you're just not looking carefully enough. And the problem with brain mapping, when you're um, looking at the laminar structure, um, the laminar distribution pattern of cell bodies in the cortex is that some borders are very, very easy to see because the laminar structures of the two areas you're comparing are just so different that anybody can see it, a beginner could see it. That's, for example, the case when you compare area 17, which is the primary visual cortex, and area 18, the directly adjacent cortex. So. If you see here, you have, um, well, if you start at the top, you've got layer one, and then you've got like a dark stripe and a paler stripe, and again, a darker stripe and a paler stripe, and here, a strikingly dark one. And here, this doesn't seem to be um, quite as, the changes aren't as abrupt as in the case of area 17. But when you move up to what we call, um, association cortices, the differences in the laminar structure become less apparent. So um, you need expertise on the one side to be able to see borders and, and you, need, um, you need to have slept well as well. You know, when you look down the microscope, sometimes you just see loads of black dots and, and you don't see the pattern. Um, but what Carl Sillis developed over the years uh, with his group was a way of quantifying these differences that we see. So his idea was, okay, we need expertise, we need people who can look down the microscope, who can see these differences in the laminar patterns of cell distributions, but we also need a way of significantly 
identifying the borders and not just saying, well, you know something, I think lamina layer two changes here because it becomes less dense or less prominent and over here it's layer five that's changing. So we want significant differences. And the way he did this was to um, develop with his team an algorithm-based detection of um, architectonical borders. Now this method slide that I'm showing you now is one uh, with a receptor um, image and not a cell body stained image, but the principle of the algorithm based detection is the same for both methods. So you start off with your section and you draw interactively, this is great fun, you draw in an outer contour line and an inner contour line, so you've um, defined in the case of receptor autoradiographs the cortical surface. In the case of cell body stain sections you've defined the border between layer one which is basically devoid of cells um, and uh, layer two and with the inner contour line you're defining the border between layer six and the white matter. And then we extract what you call profiles, um, which are basically just lines which run perpendicular to the cortical surface. And you can extract um, the gray values from the image underneath these profiles and create uh, profiles. So these are red from left to right, so zero would be the brain surface and 100 would be the border between layer 6 and the white matter. And the y-axis is, in this case, receptor density. If you're looking at cell body stain sections, what we've done is we've transformed um, the histological sections into gray images in which the gray values code for the proportion of cell bodies in the measuring field um, versus the proportion of neuropil, so the, the tissue in which um, dendrites are located, in which synapses, basically uh, synapses are found. And um, if you compare profiles from two different areas or two different sites, let's first talk about two different sites. So for example, um, In this case, we're detecting receptors. Okay, so if you're detecting receptors, what you do is you, you need fresh brains, so non-fixed brains, shock frozen. We section them and uh, we incubate um, these sections, which haven't been fixed, with ligands, which specifically are, are specifically recognized by the receptor you want to examine. And um, the ligand that you use has been radioactively labeled. That's the method, the method we use. Okay? And then you expose these radioactively um, labeled sections against a, a film, which is uh, sensitive to, to radioactivity. And then you can transform the gray values. So you've got um, dark gray codes for high receptor densities, and, and paler grays would, would code for low receptor densities. Um, if you want to look at lambda organization of the different areas, why don't we sort of in lots of the animal models you have all these like layer markers that you can label specific layers and it's mm -hmm. confusing confusion a little bit of where they are and where, what specifically they layer, but it's sort of good tools to kind of divide up and down. So what's what's the advantage of this method in sort of detecting these layer boundaries? Oh apart from maybe new histochemical. Okay, no, if we want, uh, receptors do show laminar patterns, um, they, they are associated with layers one to six that we know from site architecture, um, they're not necessarily identical, because with, with site architectonic layers, you're, you're staining the cell bodies, um, with receptors, you're staining, you're, you're visualizing the receptors, and the receptors can be found on the cell body, but basically they're on the dendrites. 
Okay, so, so that's why there's not a one-to-one -one correlation in layers revealed by receptors and layers re uh, revealed by um, cell body stainings. What we do is, when we do receptor autoradiography, is we serially section the brain. And we, we've got a series of receptors that we want to examine, but in between we have sections which we use for cell body staining and for myelin staining. And these sections are only 10 micrometers thick, so they're close enough. So afterwards you can, you can overlap um, your cell body stain section and your receptor section, and then you can transfer the layer borders which you've identified on the cell body stain sections onto your autoradiograph. And then you could say then, well, layer one starts here at zero and, and it finishes, say, at five, and, and then layer in this area, layer two goes down to 20 and, and so on and so forth, okay? Right. Um, okay, so if you take profiles from two different positions in the brain, you may find that they're different. So you think, I'm in two different areas here, okay? Um, so here, for example, you've got this peak and, and, and a, a valley, and then it goes up and plateaus and goes down again. And here you don't have this plateau at the back. And what we can do is we extract so-called feature vectors from these profiles, okay? So um, you can extract the mean density. In this case, it's the mean receptor density. Um, which for this profile would be 775, and for this profile down here, it would be 576. Um, you can um, um, extract, for example, the skewness, which tells us is the center of gravity of my profile uh, located in the deeper cortical layers or in the more superficial layers. You can extract cortosis, which would tell us is uh, the slope um, more inclined towards the left or towards the right, for example. And when you've got these feature vectors, you can calculate different distances. We've used the Mahalanobis distance, that's uh, this uh, d square distance and um, so small distances would say these two profiles are very similar and large distances would say these two profiles are very dif different. Now we don't do this for two isolated profiles, right? What we do is uh, we um, have groups of profiles, they are identified here by these two colored blocks and then we use a so-called sliding window procedure and for every one of these positions along the cortex so we calculate the um, Mahalanobis distance okay and um, we plot it so you'd have zero that would be my first profile which would be uh, down here and then the last profile it just depends on on the size of the um, of the region that you're examining. And here, to help us, these stars just label every tenth profile. Right, and then you see peaks, and it's a very, very noisy peak. And we say, right, well, very high number, that would be a very large distance, and a small peak, that would mean that the profiles that we've been, been comparing here are very similar. Mm, we can test the height of these peaks, and we do that with a, with a Hotelling's t-test, and this then tells us the position of uh, significantly different blocks of profiles. So that's what we call borders then for our areas. And back to the example that I showed at the beginning, we'd have this first peak here would be a first border, and then the second one here, and so on. And this is the cingulate cortex. This is my um, favorite part of the cortex. So you've got down here, you'd have the corpus callosum, we've got area 33 and um, um, the anterior part of the mid-cingulate area 24A. This border isn't shown by this receptor. That's one of the things about receptors, that they don't all show all possible borders. But it does show then the ones between areas 24A and 24B and within the cingulate sulcus, the ventral and the dorsal positions of um, 24C, okay? Um, 
Now, I want to stress the fact that when we, we talk about an observer-independent method for the detection of cortical borders, it's not that we don't use the microscope, because I've I've read articles in which they say, oh, that Silas group, you know, they don't look down the microscope, they just um, use this algorithm-based method, and that's why their parcellation scheme isn't the same as ours, because we used expertise in looking down the microscope. We combine both. So we first look down the microscope, and uh, we look for our region of interest, and we confirm our borders um, with uh, this method here. And this helped us, for example, to identify the border between um, Rotma's areas 44 and 45. Now, they are characterized by uh, a relatively thin layer 4, but in the case of area 44, it's even thinner than in 45. So it becomes disgranular, and sometimes the pyramids of layer 3 and the ones of, pyramid of, of layer 5 intermingle. So there are some positions at which you don't find a layer 4. You can't really follow it all along um, area 44. That's what we talk about, a, a disgranular um, layer 4, a disgranular area. Um, they're both characterized by relatively um, large um, pyramids uh, in layer 3, so you can see particularly in the lower part of layer 3, so the border between layer 3 and layer 4. So you can see these relatively large black dots here and down here. You don't see that many up here, so you don't see as many large pyramids in layers 3a and b as you'd see down in 3c. Um, this is particularly true for area 45. So the difference in size of um, layer 3 pyramids is bigger in between superficial and deeper layer 3 is bigger in area 45 than it is in area um, 44. Now, the other thing that we wanted to do, or that not we want to do, I mean I want to do it as well, but it was um, Carl's idea, and it's been developed over the years, was um, one of the big problems with the classical maps is that they're in two dimensions, they're drawings. And, um, and many of them are even based on just like one hemisphere or maybe one brain. So, and we know from many studies, and this morning it was mentioned several times, and I'm sure you said so as well, you've got different patients, every patient reacts in a different way. So there's a great inter-individual variability. So Carl's idea was uh, what we need is um, a map in three dimensions because the functional imaging studies that we have nowadays, they're all in um, three dimensions. And what we need is a map that will give us an idea of inter-individual variability. So what we all have to do is um, identify these areas, not in one hemisphere, not in one brain, but we have to do it in ten brains. Now, obviously, it would be better to examine many more brains, but this is a very time-consuming um, work. It's time-consuming both um, and it's expensive. So, at the technical side, creating all of these sections, staining them, that's a lot of very hard work plus the scientific part, identifying the areas and so on. So that's why we've, it's limited to 10. And um, the idea is we've got a post-mortem brain and it's scanned. So we've got an MR volume of this post-mortem brain, which is then sectioned, okay? And that's what you see here. We've got a uh, brain which has been fixed and embedded in paraffin to enable sectioning. And along here, you see a load um, of sections, and over here in the background, what you see here are stacks of um, basically trays uh, containing loads and loads of sections. So one um, human brain sectioned in the coronal um, plane of sectioning produces approximately 7,000 sections. That's uh, 20 micrometer thick sections. That's something that you can 
share with your friends at our next um, party. Um, while we are sectioning, there's a camera located above uh, the block here, and it's taking so-called block face images. So you've got photographs of the brain before it is sectioned, because this sectioning here is going to bring distortions into your section, and when you then afterwards mount these sections onto glass slides to be able to stain them, that's also going to bring distortions in, and we basically want to afterwards reconstruct all of these sections and create a volume with which we can work, okay? So that's why we need the block face images as references, undistorted references, to um, create our volume. Now, these sections are then stained, um, in the past, we used to stay in every 15th section for cell bodies, and uh, so, so section yeah, 1 and 15 and so on for cell bodies, and sections 2 and 16 and so on for myelin staining. Right now they are working on projects in which every single section is stained for cell bodies. So you've got 7,000 sec uh, uh, sections. And um, that's the, the idea is to create a, the so-called big brain, so we'd have a big brain with a microscopic resolution throughout the entire brain. Sorry, Nicola, do you get, are these mostly healthy? Yes, sorry, these are all uh, relatively old brains um, because most donors were old when they died, um, but they're all healthy, so these are all control brains. And they don't tend to have language-related disorders? Not that we know of. There's, there's no, no history. Um, I mean, this kind of thing isn't done with whole brains for um, diseased um, ones. We don't, we don't have that, no. Um, diseased brains, there, there are different projects, like, for example, schizophrenia versus controls, but they're normally just blocks because you want to look at specific brain regions. If you look at, say, subcortical structures like thalamic nuclei, if you're able to, do you also, with the receptor... You can also, you can also yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, so yeah. Okay, so then afterwards, you can combine the information from your MR scan, from your block face images, and your histological sections, and you can create what we call a histological volume, right? Um, and then, afterwards, you have other people that are interested in particular brain regions, so they look down the microscope, they look for their region, they find their borders, they confirm the position of these borders with the observer-independent method, and then we have to draw the borders onto these histological sections so that when the transformations that are used to bring the histological sections, sections into the MR volume of that brain um, can also be used to transfer the borders of cytochedictonically defined areas into that same space. Okay, so here we have, for example, uh, so we've got brain one, 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 two, and then you think about three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and up to ten. Okay. And because we want to use a common reference space, which is also used by all other neuroscientists, these individual brains are transferred into um, a reference space. They're warped into that space. And in our case, we use the Montreal Neurological Institute reference brain, um, either the Colin mm, 27 or the... Uh, Oh, I forget what it's called, the 153, I think it's called, brain. 152, thank you. Um, they're warped into that space. So now you have, and then you can overlap all of these brains because they're all in a common reference space. And you get what we call a continuous probability map. So here, um, blue colors code for <coughs> voxels in which um, only one of the ten examined brains um, was, was found, and red colors code for uh, voxels in which all um, ten 
brains were found. So you can use these continuous probabilistic maps um, to identify you know, functional data or to identify um, the extent of, of lesions. Um, the problem starts when you've got several different areas. Uh, you see, if you've got blue here, it means you only have one brain with, um, th in this case, we've got area 10. So you only had um, one brain with area 10 and that voxel. Now, the next area here would be area 9. So once you get round to mapping area 9, you'd have an overlap of um, area 10 and area 9 there. And we don't want any overlap. So that's why we created um, the um, maximum probability maps, okay? These are maps um, in which when you have two adjacent areas, uh, you look at the voxel and you say, right, well, which of the two areas has the highest probability of being in that voxel? And then you assign it to that area. And if both areas have the same probability in one voxel, then um, you, you um, look at the neighboring voxels and depending on that then you assign the voxel to that. So these are the maximum probability maps. These, uh, um, and I happily say we developed, but actually I didn't develop any, any um, of this. I'm just a user. Yeah, I, I must say, because I, I didn't develop any. I think, it's, I think it's fantastic work. I think sometimes when I'm looking at a brain and I, I have problems identifying a sulcus, I wonder how um, the, the physicists think of ways of identifying gray values that then help them warp one brain into the next brain. So on. I, you know, it's, it's fascinating. Okay. Well, if it's so, because it's very hard, you wonder how precise the position was. You'd, wa exactly you'd wonder it. how it is. Nina, you have a, an MR data set of, of his brain. So it might be interesting to overlap yeah, well, the MR yeah. with the probability maps to see. I mean, I mean you, you know that his brain, there's not just cortex, there are all sorts of things underneath and it's not just 44 and 45, it's all sorts of things and, and the brain is terribly deformed so the physicists are going to roll their eyes and say, oh my god, it's going to be impossible and, and it's a post-mortem MR scan and, and, and um, all sorts of things. But so it could be. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. So this um, is an example of, of what can be done with the maximum probability maps. So they can be used to, for the interpretation of functional imaging studies. And um, so in this case, the blue blobs uh, indicate sites at, at which um, activation um, was, was um, located during a verbal um, fluency um, task. And then uh, yellow and red code for uh, Bro um, Brodmann's areas 45 and 44. And green indicates the position in which we've got an overlap between, in this case, it would be Brodmann's area 45 and um, the functional activation induced by um, a verbal fluency task. Okay. Now, the maps can also be, yeah, so the semantic task activates um, left area 45, okay. Now, the, the, these maps can also be used for volumetric studies because, um, I mean, we say that size doesn't matter, but sometimes size uh, is, is important. And um, this figure here shows uh, areas um, 44 and 45 in um, three different, di different left hemispheres and um, three right hemispheres. 
And what you can see is that between um, the different brains, um, the, the extent of these two areas, it varies from individual to individual. And we've also got differences within, individu within an individual between the left and the right hemisphere. And um, what we also see, and that's one of the big problems in, in, um, in anatomy, is that the position of these cytoarchitectonically defined borders does not necessarily coincide with, with um, cell psi or gyri, so with what we call microscopical landmarks. Okay? So in this case, um, you've got the diagonal sulcus, which in this hemisphere here, is a wonderful marker for the border between 44 and 45, but up here it isn't because it's right in the middle of area 44. And in this brain over here, for example, there isn't a diagonal sulcus. So uh, for this part of the brain, macroscopical landmarks are not reliable um, sources to identify the position of borders. For, for some parts, it is like so. So for for Broca's area, it's it's not good at all. Um, if you look at Broadman's area twenty four, yes, it is, because it's it's on the cingulate gyrus. It goes into the cingulate sulcus, and then the border between area twenty four and thirty two rostrally, or nine and, and eight and six, is located on the dorsal border of the cingulate sulcus. But that's not, and it's like in the outer third of, of the dorsal part of the cingulate sulcus. So it's, it's, it's not a statement that can be generalized for the whole brain or for all cortical uh, brain regions. Um, there have been studies in the past which have tried to find an association between cytochitectonical borders and macroscopical landmarks. Um, and then there were studies in which it was categorically stated, no, there is no relationship whatsoever. And then we're coming back to, well, in certain cases there is, but not always. So you'd have to examine enough brains and so on to be able to say, right, well, for this area, yes, this sulcus would be a good landmark for this area, forget it. Can I ask one more, let's see, maybe even more fundamental question. So this wonderful work shows that on the one hand, we, with this minor and this distance, we can find the site of the borders, but if you do minor architectonics or septal architectonics, the border is not necessarily the same. So what now is, what now is the definition of an area? How we know, are we defining an area based on site of architectonics alone? Yes. Or on all three? And, and, and so the notion is what, what do you consider from the new anatomical perspective to be an area? That, okay, that, that's a very difficult question. What is a border, um, an area? Um, yes, well, it would be the smallest entity with, a, with the same structural and functional characteristics. But what is the smallest entity? I mean, we're going back to the, this morning's question about, no, yes, yes, whatever, a question of, of if you're looking at, at, at groups, like do you want to find the relationship between um, the bat, the object, and the bat, the animal, are they both things? Or this? Oh. Um, we think that the cortex is organized in a modular way, so you've got the very, very small modules, which would be like columns, and then you move up to areas or regions, sub-areas. Um, the border between what's a column, what's a sub-area, what's an area is still a bit of a, a grey zone. Carl and Catherine actually just had a, a review accepted in, in Neuron discussing this. Um, so it would be interesting to read. There is no categorical answer, unfortunately. Oh, I'm sorry, one thing, the position of borders. Um, receptors don't show all borders, but when they show a border, it is at comparable positions. And when you compare the position of that border in different receptor 
types with the borders that you'd find in uh, cytoarchitectonical um, histological um, section, it's also at the same position, it's a comparable position. So you do have a basic organization which gives you an area with a, a certain laminar and, and molecular mm -hmm. structure. Can I ask one, one question? Mm -hmm. So uh, you said in uh, brokers there are layer four is relatively thin. Now if you, if you believe uh, the general characterization of the, the role of the corporate layers, and layer four is the input layer, um, and what's the consequence of the fact that in Roper's area this is relatively thinner than other areas? Well, is there, is there for, for some consequence of the fact that this, uh, the volume of that particular layer is relatively small compared to other layers? Yes. Um, if you don't mind, I'd rather wait with that question because it's something that I wanted to address later on in the talk. Okay? Okay. Um, right. And um, do we see, I guess, different methods, probably different methods, I suppose, but do we see this degree of variation if you look at the embryonic brain. So over development, do we see that this, with using sort of slightly different methods, I imagine, do we see so much variation during development because they'll kind of explain the variation at the adult level? It hasn't been done systematically. The problem is obtaining the brains. Yes, yes, that, that would be a big, that would be a big problem, yes. Um, Okay, one of the other things that I wanted to say here is that uh, on these two images here, so the surface of the brain, it looks as if uh, area 45 is a lot bigger than area 44. But if you actually then go down and um, calculate the volume of each one of these areas, you see that area 45 um, and 44 are, are both similar in size. So there's just a lot more going on uh, inside um, the, the cell side. That's another one of the problems with, for example, uh, Brodmann's map, he only shows um, the surface of the brain. Now, once we start talking about volumes, um, we look and we see, okay, so the left hemisphere, 3,000, almost 500, uh, cubic millimeters and 3,600 and, and here we're only in the 2,000 range in the right hemisphere and we're saying we're looking at a, a brain region involved in language and, and we've heard before that language, not all parts of language production and comprehension but language is l largely lateralized, left hemispheric, so we say wonderful left hemisphere larger than right hemisphere, that would explain why language is, um, is left lateralized. Um, when you go into the individual brains, oh, what we found for areas 44 and 45 is that there was only a significant left-right differences in the size um, for area 44 and not for area 45. And um, if you've got differences in volume in the brain, you could have different causes for this, for this difference. So we are looking now at cytoarchitectonically defined areas. Okay, So could it be that left area 44 has more cells than right? 44, and I'm using the word cell because I don't want to go into neurons, into neurons, etc. It's just, does it have, is it bigger because it has more cells? Or is it bigger because the cells in the left hemisphere are bigger than the cells in the right hemisphere? Or could there be another reason? Any ideas? Mm -hmm. But cell packing density um, would mean that you have more cells in one side than in the other side. Okay, uh, per volume. Well, it would mean that in equal volumes you have different numbers of cells, or an equal number of cells in different volumes. Or, or cell, let's talk about, because in this case what we calculated was um, the gray level index, which gives us proportion of cell bodies versus neuropil. 
So if you've got a higher cell packing density, you've got more cell bodies, but you've got then maybe more space, if it's bigger, you've got more space for neuropil. Um, in the case of area 44, what we found was that these differences in size weren't due to differences in the size of the cells or in the number of cells, but it was due to the fact that um, there was more neuropil in the left hemisphere than in the right hemisphere. So somehow um, the part of the cortex dedicated to really connectivity, synapses, that's the part. So there's dendritic arborization currently? Exactly. What was that you said? Dendritic arborization. So is that also the kind of thing that the voxel based morphometry is increasing? So because we don't assume that the increased size of the, the area is due to more cells, but that can be also you see it can be again different from area to area so it's not something that I'd generalize on these, these are kind of things as, as a result of the fact that you juggle for three months and you get these results based brain, yeah. brain matter which is unlikely to be increased it's, it's, it's probably <laughs> due to an increased um, mm. connectivity yeah okay um, Could you test that in your system? Sorry? Could you test that with the, samples, with the sort of data you have? Because you have the different areas. And so just yeah. a general increase in connectivity compared to other regions? Of the well, there was a study, for example, years ago by the Zillis group. Um, Schlauch was the first author. And um, they looked at um, the primary motor cortex. And um, they compared professional piano players with normal controls. And what they found is that in the primary motor cortex, you've got a strong degree of asymmetry. So, so normally, they had, they had right-handed subjects. So normally, the left um, central sulcus, in which the primary motor cortex is located, was deeper than the right. Um, central sulcus in non-professional um, piano players. That was the same, that was the MRI? Yeah, that was just uh, yeah. structural MRI. And, and when they looked at the piano players, they found that the depth of the, of, of the central sulcus was practically identical in the left and the right hemisphere, right? Because they have to use both hands with equal dextrity, and I can't say the word. Thank you. Dexterity. And the other thing that they found was that piano players that had started um, playing when they were very young had an even deeper central sulcus than, than the professional players that had started uh, playing later on. So you do have a certain amount of plasticity and, and practice and that would um, increase the connectivity. So talking about symmetrical differences between left and right. In the case of the piano players, um, we see that, that if left and right hemispheres are, 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 they are the same because they need both hands um, equally. If we look at the left and right hemispheres at areas 44 and 45, left and right hemispheres, um, and we think of somebody who's great at languages, do you think that then their left and right brokers would be um, more or less symmetric? Because language is lateralized. So would, would you expect um, the left-right differences to become greater with somebody who's uh, great with languages? Or, or would you expect um, the right hemisphere to start to get involved? The first one. So the asymmetry would, would get... Well, this is a single case, okay? Um, and, 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 and we've just criticized uh, Brodmann's map because it's one hemisphere. The problem is that, that you don't get hold of, um, 
of brains of so uh, Krebs was considered a, a genius um, um, he was a uh, legations rat, which is sort of a counselor. I, I think he'd be nowadays we, we'd, you'd call him a diplomat, and um, he spoke more than sixty languages, and he apparent fluently, and um, and he apparently had impressive capabilities. He could learn a new language like within two weeks. Um, even we're not just talking about like languages that are more or less similar because you've got like Italian, Spanish, French all with the same um, Latin origins. We're talking about, well, you know, Italian, Spanish and French and German and Dutch and Armenian and, and Chinese, but not just Chinese, different um, Mandarin Chinese and Japanese and God knows what else um, he learned. And, and his brain was, was, um, was actually stored at the, at the Vogt um, Brain Research. And uh, Catherine Amons carried out a, a very nice study and, and um, examined his areas 44 and 45 and compared them with areas 44 and 45 of, of age-matched ma age um, male control brains. And she, she found that um, the brain of Krebs had a, a higher proportion of neuropil versus cell bodies than uh, male controls had, and this asymmetry between areas 44 or left and right areas 44 wasn't present in his brain. Is there, are there any DNA samples there? <laughs> <laughs> the brain has been fixed. I mean, there are, but so I can't do receptor autoradiography either. Because it's been fixed. <laughs> okay, so now I've been talking about Broca's core region, 44 and 45, and um, I'd like to say something about about the other areas in in what we could describe as, as Broca's complex, and um, and the fact that that is not just areas 44 and, and 45 involved in speech has come from, from loads and loads of different functional imaging studies. And I've just got a couple of examples here. So, so there were tasks involved in, in syntax or, or phonology or different um, task swi switching um, tasks, which, which revealed really localized um, activation sites which weren't found within areas 44 and 45. And um, we decided to look at uh, the Broca region with receptor autoradiography. Okay, I'm going to start with the posterior part. So these sections here are <laughs> coronal sections through a whole human hemisphere, approximately at the site uh, indicated um, by this white line here. And, and our, the original autoradiographs are just um, gray values. So our images have 256 um, different uh, gray values ranging from so white, which would be a zero receptor density, and, and black, which would be a very high receptor density. The concentration depends on the receptor you're examining. And the problem is that the human eye isn't, isn't able to, to distinguish between all of these different um, subtle changes in gray densities. So what we do is we, we simply divide these 256 gray values into 11 discrete sections and assign each one of them a color. So we are, we are, um, we are doing a, a contrast enhancement. Um, so in all the receptor images that I'm going to be showing you today, um, black, blue tones code for very low receptor densities and uh, green for intermediate and then you go into the orange and red that means high receptor densities. In these two autoradiographs here um, I'm, I'm showing the, the numbers because the point I want to make here is that, that the colors 
don't necessarily code for the same receptor density when you're looking at different receptor types, okay? Because some receptors are present in very high densities all over in the brain. So for example, receptors for, for the, for the inhibited, inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA, very, very high densities. Um, other receptors such as uh, dopamine or um, the nicotinic receptors for acetylcholine are present in very low receptor density. So um, in, in for GABA ergic receptors, we'd be, we'd be in the range of maybe 4,000 femtomol per milligram protein when we're up here in the red uh, range. Um, but for dopamine or nicotinic receptors, we might only be in the range of of 20 to 50 femtomol per milligram protein, okay? So these are the different ranges. Um, but it would make the slides terribly noisy if in every one I showed the numbers for everything. And, and the point that I want to make here isn't so much um, that we've got a whole load of this receptor type and not that much of that other receptor type. The point that I want to make with these images is that receptors are not homogeneously distributed throughout the brain, okay? So here um, you can see that the superficial layers, kinate receptors are relatively low, but in the deeper layers um, they're present in very high densities. And when you compare this section with the cell body stain section, section, we know that this red stripe here corresponds to cortical layers 5 and 6. And when you're looking at subcortical structures, you can also see like, for example, um, the chordae and the striatum, you can see different parts of the um, thalamus, they all have uh, different densities with the different receptors, okay? So we use these differences in the lamina distribution of the receptors and the difference, oop, the differences in the uh, regional densities to identify cortical borders. And we identify these borders with or, or we confirm the position of these borders with the algorithm-based method. So, um, what we see here is that the kinate receptors um, identify the border within area 44. So we've got uh, Brodmann's area 44 with the rest of the world and we know that it's Brodmann area 44 because we've compared it with, with an adjacent cell body sense uh, section. But in here within 44 we see that this part here has a slightly lower density than this part here of kinate receptors. Um, the same thing happens here uh, with the adrenergic alpha 1 receptors. So uh, we've got a subdivision of Brodmann's area 44 into a, a dorsal and a ventral part. Um, within the inferior frontal sulcus, this is the position at which the inferior frontal sulcus in this brain um, merges or runs into the precentral sulcus, we've identified um, the area which, is, which has been called inferior frontal junction um, 1. And then this uh, opercular part, we've got an opercular area 8 and a 7, and then here we move down into the insula. So the kinate receptors don't show the border between OP8 and OP7, but the alpha-1 receptors um, do show it. And the position at which alpha-1 receptor densities change here between 44D and 44V is comparable to the position at which the kinate receptors change, okay? And if we look at a couple more um, examples, we see um, now, for example, that GABA-A receptors don't distinguish the border between, or don't reveal the, board, the border between 44D and 44V, but they do show the border between OP8 and OP7. Um, and so on and so forth. So we, we do this for a battery of 15 to 20 different receptor types. <coughs> so based on this, we've been able to subdivide Brodmann's area 44 into a dorsal and a ventral part. And here in the sulcus, we've 
identified um, at this rostrocaudal um, level an area called inferior frontal junction 1 and OP8 and OP7. Now if we move um, forward, so we go into 45, we find that 45 can also be subdivided into um, what we've called an anterior and a posterior part. So we call the 44 dorsal and ventral because there we didn't see, um, uh, it really was at the same rostrocaudal level of 44, there was an up and a down part. And anatomists, we use dorsal and ventral for that. With 45A and 45P, although they seem to be on top of each other here, so you could wonder, well, why don't you call it dorsal and ventral as well? But the 44A starts before 45P, so that's why that name was, was used. And then here, within the inf inferior frontal sulcus, we then no longer have um, the, the inferior frontal jun junction area one. We have uh, inferior frontal sulcus area one. And um, area OP7 has been replaced by um, OP9. Um, and again, these borders can be um, identified by different receptor types. And again, when you find a border, like for example the OP9 with the insula, it's in the same position with different receptors. Um, the thought is that, that because not all receptors show all borders, they might be giving us hints as to groups of areas that are involved in similar functions, so more sub-regions or sub-areas than areas. Sorry, can I ask another question? Um, if you try and sort of group together say, different GABA receptors, a different sort of serotonin receptors, do these boundaries sort of blur, become a bit more blurred? Is this sort of, do you have GABA A receptors in one region sort of enriched and then GABA B receptors sort of down regulated in that particular region? But is there, do they kind of complement each other, each other if you? Group them together correctly. So, like, just it's quite interesting that they have this some sort of heterogeneous. Oh, some know. some receptors. Um, again, so that's another question that I'd like to to um, talk about afterwards because it is something that I've got a slide for now. If I slide forward, I'll show you all my slides now. Okay. Um, so, based on this receptor study, um, Catherine created a new map of, of the Broca region in which, so 44, Brodmann's 44 has now been divided into two parts. And, and um, here you can see why they're called anterior and posterior quite clearly. Then we've got 44 ventral and 44 dorsal. And uh, within the inferior frontal sulcus, there's an inferior frontal sulcus area one and two on the ventral bank on the sulcus. We've um, already identified uh, also an inferior frontal sulcus um, three and four located more on, 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 the, on the dorsal bank of the inferior frontal sulcus. When we move further caudally to the point where the inferior frontal sulcus sometimes, not always, but uh, sometimes merges with the precentral sulcus, we've got inferior frontal uh, junction areas uh, one and two, and then we found so far with these divisions that um, we can subdivide Brodmann's area 6. So way down here um, at, at the level of the lateral fissure, you, we've got a 6R1 um, and then comes a 6V1 and a 6V2 and we've only just reached the inferior frontal sulcus. So Brodmann's area 6 is definitely much more complex. Um, than, than his map shows and, and it, it only, it's actually logical because the functional imaging studies, there's none that's been able to activate all of what Brodmann described as area 6. Okay, and then within the lateral fissure you've got uh, opercular areas uh, 4, 6, 
eight, nine, and then deeper in the lateral fissure, not visible here in this map, uh, would be opercular um, area seven. So your earlier, earlier uh, definition of Brown's region, we also have what was area 47? Because because Catherine had to leave a bit of, of Broca's region for another of another yes. It has not been it's, it's not been it's not been worked on yet. It's not been worked on yet. Okay, so now that I've finished Broca's complex, I think it will be a good time to have a short or long or whatever coffee break.